Hello, and welcome to the Watcher's Review of The Demons, a story of magic, science, witches, and an alien resembling the devil. Please be aware there are potential spoilers ahead. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you can be alerted for more content. The Doctor, Joe, and Unit team up with a white witch to stop the master, posing as the village vicar of Devil's End, from summoning a demon-like alien and using its powers to control the earth. John Pertwee, by now, was fully in his stride as the third Doctor, and the demons represent one of his best performances. The Doctor has always been a debunker of magic and superstition in favour of science, and this has to be the best example of him doing just that. He is initially intrigued by the talk of the archaeological dig at the village, and sets out to Devil's End with Joe to stop it, although he doesn't reveal why. He fails, gets frozen, and as a result spends half the second episode in a coma. After awakening, he seemingly has worked everything out from when he was in his coma, and sets to dispel the magic and superstition. Firstly, he explains the shock of the cold from the dig, and the following shockwave of heat, by explaining the effects of miniaturisation of Azal and his ship buried in the dig, that caused an energy displacement. Secondly, by means of a presentation in the local pub for Joe, Benton, Yates and the White Witch Miss Hawthorne, he highlights how cultures from all around the world have a shared belief in horned beasts which are influenced by aliens called demons who have been visiting Earth and influencing evolution and civilization as some kind of science experiment to judge if humanity is a success or not. Finally, as a means to get the superstitious villagers under the master's influence on side, he uses science to appear as magic, with the help of Miss Hawthorne, Benton, and a remote control for his car Bessie, which is used numerous times as a means to prove to people not to take things at face value. The third Doctor, in my opinion, is the most scientist-like of all the incarnations of the Doctor, due in part to his exile on Earth. The fact he doesn't cross paths with the Master until the final episode allows him to exert his knowledge in science with characters who aren't at his level of intellect, rather than spending the majority of the story sparring off with his adversary, as it had been in previous stories. This was Joe Grant's first season as the Doctor's companion, following the departure of Liz Shaw. What she lacks in knowledge compared to Liz, she makes up for enthusiasm, determination, bubbly personality and utter devotion to the Doctor. She sparks the Doctor's interest in travelling to Devil's End when she informs him of the archaeological dig being televised. She then stays by the Doctor's side during his coma, and her determination to find out what the Master is doing leads her to explore the cavern where the Master is operating. Although it ultimately leads to her capture and briefly becoming a damsel in distress when the Master plans to sacrifice her to Azal, she ultimately saves the day when her devotion to the Doctor goes as far to protect him from Azal's power and leads to his defeat due to him not being able to process why someone would willingly sacrifice their own life to protect the life of another. Joe Grant is one of the classic series most popular companions and had a unique bond with the Doctor that is a mix between close friend and teacher and student. Although she wasn't of high science intellect like Liz or early companions such as Susan, Barbara, Vicky and Zoe, she was certainly brave and savvy and not full of screams at any of the Doctor's adversaries. Joe's persona acted as a blueprint for popular female companions that have since appeared all the way up to the present day. This was the Master's debut season, having appeared in all five of season eight stories, either as a primary or secondary antagonist, and provided a sort of story arc to the whole season. Here in The Demons, he uses science, Master's black magic, summon Azal and use his power to control the earth. The master poses as the village's new vicar under the name Mr Magister with his predecessor having vanished and uses the job of a vicar to abuse the position of trust to his advantage in winning the villagers over initially through charm and persuasion but then by use of his hypnotic powers and blackmailing. The doctor quickly sees through his disguise by recognising the Magister name as a Latin term for Master. Although the Master has already used an alias for his disguises in previous stories such as Professor Keller in The Mind of Evil 
and the Earth Adjudicator in Colony of Space, this was the first time he used an alias that was related to the word master, either through a different language or in anagram form, something that would be used again on numerous occasions throughout the series. The majority of the master's scenes take place in the cavern, where he is on face value practicing black magic to not only summon Azal, but to also animate the stone gargoyle Bok, which the master then uses as a weapon to eliminate people who stand in the way of his plans. Like a figure of authority, secret practicing so-called dark arts, he manages to establish a secret league of followers from the village, including Bert, the pub landlord, his verger Garvin, and the local villager Tom Girton, who are all used in some shape or form to carry out the master's dirty work so that he can carry on preserving the identity of the wholesome vicar. However, as previously mentioned, as the story developed, he starts using more direct methods to convert the rest of the village to do his bidding. As noted before, the master and the doctor don't actually come face to face until the final episode, which gives the master more screen time in which he is the main focal point in terms of characterization and something which actor Roger Delgado carries out brilliantly. Although producer Barry Letts considered having the master as a character in every story of season 8 as a mistake, I think it was a brilliant way in which to establish all the characteristics of the master that are even present today when played by other actors. Although I personally don't have an out and out favourite incarnation of the master, I do feel Roger Delgado's take on the character is perhaps the most layered. From the character's debut in Terror of the Autons up to this story, the groundwork and blueprint of the master is all laid out for years to come. A master of disguise, a master of hypnotist, a cold-blooded killer, an intelligence on par with the doctor, a charming villain and an unhinged menacing villain are all present not only in the demons but the whole of season 8 and by the end of this story you know that this is a villain that is here to stay for the long term and has already moved in with the ranks of the Daleks and Cybermen as one of the show's key adversaries. Azal is a daemon, as the doctor pronounces it, from the planet Deimos, who is released from miniaturized status during the excavation and takes refuge in the cavern where he will allow to be summoned three times before deciding on the fate of the earth. In original form, Azal stands at 30 foot tall with horns and hooves features that are associated with demons and the devil in many cultures, which the doctor explained was Azal's race's influence on human civilization. Azal is one of the most iconic monsters of this particular period of Doctor Who. However, in truth, his appearance is very limited due to his reduced screen presence as well as budget limitations. I'm sure had the budget been available, then it would have been a spectacle to see Azal sweeping through the village and wreaking havoc. However, all we are presented with is the body of a police officer who was guarding the dig which Azal crushed, the hoof marks left in the ground that Benton and Yates witnessed from the helicopter, as well as Azal's perspective when he vaporises Garvin, who tries to shoot him. His actual physical appearances all occur in the cavern when the Master summons him, and his eventual destruction caused by Joe's intervention blows up the cavern and the church. Azal was played here by Stephen Thorne, who was making his debut in Doctor Who, but was used again throughout the series due to his ability to deliver a certain tone of voice behind masks and prosthetics. After playing Azal, he went on to play Omega in The Three Doctors, an Ogron in Frontier in Space, as well as the male incarnation of Eldrad in The Hand of Fear. Miss Hawthorne is the village's white witch, who is dismissed by many as someone who should have been locked up due to her beliefs. She quickly becomes an ally to the Doctor, Joe and Unit, due to her not buying into the Master's impression of being a vicar, and being impervious to his hypnotism. However, the Doctor still has to go out of his way, in particular with Miss Hawthorne, in convincing her that the ongoings in the village are a result of science and not magic. Eventually being convinced by the Doctor about the power of science, she still resorts to her witchcraft ways as a form of trickery to play into the fears of the villagers under the Master's control when they try to burn the Doctor at the stake. She informs them that the Doctor is the great wizard Qui Quai Quod, which is actually an amalgamation of three Latin words for who, apologies if I haven't said them right, who is more powerful than the Master. 
With the help of Benton's marksmanship and the Doctor's remote control for Bessie, she convinces the Doctor to go along with a fake ability of moving things with the power of his mind so that the villagers will free him out of fear. This is an interesting story from a unit perspective in that they are essentially split into two groups. Due to the Brigadier leaving for a function, he leaves Captain Yates and Sergeant Benton running things. As such, when they hear of the Doctor in trouble at the dig, they head off to Devil's End in the Brigadier's helicopter. Once in the village, in civilian clothing for a change, Benton and Yates assist the Doctor, Joe and Miss Hawthorne. In the meantime, the Brigadier has been made aware of the situation and begins heading to the village himself with troops in tow. However, the Master, or Azal, has put a heat barrier around the village, ensuring no one can get in or out. This leaves the Brigadier and the troops unable to penetrate the barrier until the Doctor manages to communicate to them how to build a device to break through. The unit soldier tasked with building the device is the one-off character Sergeant Osgood. I actually found Osgood an interesting character who suffers from the Doctor's frustrations as he is clearly confused with the instructions handed to him to build the machine and as such brings some comic relief to the story. Although this was his only on-screen appearance, his character was developed more in novel form. No doubt fans more familiar with the newer series will have noticed there is another unit operative with the surname of Osgood, and that is Petronella Osgood, who, like her namesake, has a scientific background and both wear similar styled rimmed glasses. This is no coincidence that Stephen Moffat had originally written Petronella Osgood to be Sergeant Osgood's daughter and following in his footsteps. However, this idea was later dropped to avoid any possible confusion and anger amongst fans of both the classic and new series. The writer of The Demons is credited to Guy Leopold, except that Guy Leopold doesn't actually exist and was used as a pseudonym for producer Barry Letts and writer Robert Sloman, which could have been in part due to the BBC's rules preventing Barry Letts to be credited as both a producer and a writer. At the time of its release, a trend of folk horror was on the rise in British cinema, and elements of rituals, the devil and witches, had already been seen in films such as Witchfinder General, The Blood on Satan's Claw, and The Devil Rides Out. However, all of these are period set pieces, as opposed to The Demons, which has a contemporary setting. Letts and Sloman also took inspiration from the 1968 book Chariots of the Gods, Unsolved Mysteries of the Past by Swiss author Eric von Daniken, which explores the theory of technologies and religions of ancient civilizations, were provided by aliens who in turn were worshipped as gods. Great care was taken with the wording and writing of the script in order not to cause offence to anyone's religious beliefs. The first notable thing is the title itself being written with a typographic ligature in place of the letter E. As such, there is a difference in pronunciation in the word with both demons and daemons being used in the story. Secondly, any words such as God, Jesus, Christianity, etc. were not included so to avoid offence even to the point of where the master is using incantations to summon Azal. He's actually speaking the nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb backwards, when the original intention was to use the Lord's Prayer. Despite the intentional swerving of any religious words used in the story, the devil is referenced often throughout. The final change used to prevent offence was the use of a cavern located beneath the church that the master used for his rituals to summon Azal. Technically, this should have been a crypt. However, it was purposely written as a cavern to once again prevent offence and to clearly distinguish religion from apparent devil worshipping. The Demons was directed by Christopher Barry, which was his sixth contribution to the show, but his first since 1966, The Power of the Daleks. His method of filming the story reduced the showings of the budget limitations, primarily with the use of Azal, and that he is seldom seen until the second half of the story, and as such, uses scenes where it is evident that he has been present, such as the hoof prints, or when he kills Garvin, the scene is actually shown from Azal's perspective. When it does come to eventually showing Azal, he 
it cleverly uses colour separation overlay, an early version of green screen, and various camera angles coupled with zoom shots to give off the impression of his ability to grow up to 30 feet tall. Another method of getting round budget limitations was the inclusion of stock footage. During the scene where one of the master's followers, Tom Girton, attempts to force the doctor to drive into the heat barrier with the unit helicopter, unused footage from the James Bond film from Rush With Love was used when the helicopter blows up, rather than using a cheap, unconvincing effect which would have brought an action-packed scene to a disappointing end. There is also an interesting aspect regarding some of the model work. During the finale of the story, Azal's defeat leads to the destruction of the cavern, and in turn the church blowing up. Naturally, a model of a church was used, as such was the realistic aspects and detail of the model. The viewers were convinced that it was a real church getting blown up, and it proved to be the most controversial scene in the story, since the production team and writers had gone through the trouble of avoiding any kind of religious orientation to prevent that controversy. Additionally, when it came to selecting the location shoots for the demons, Christopher Barry and producer Barry Letts between them looked up every village in the south of England with a long barrow, and as such the village of Oldbourne in Wiltshire was picked to replicate the village of Devil's End, with an area called Four Barrows just located over a mile away, used as filming for the excavation dig. Christopher Barry also had the additional difficulty of filming night scenes, which were a rarity at the time, in particular with the excavation scenes, and the opening scenes of when a man walking his dog from the pub is killed in the graveyard. Scenes with the Doctor and Joe driving through the night in Bessie were done in the daytime, with the use of filters to give off the impression that it was actually at night. Music for the Demons was provided by Dudley Simpson, who uses the familiar sounds of a synthesizer that was prominent throughout the John Pertwee era of Doctor Who, and in particular, the motif used for the emergence of the Master. This actually couples in nicely with Brian Hodgson and the BBC Radiophonic Workshop sound effects, in particular the wind effects used for the heat barrier, and the flapping wing effects to give the impression of Bok flying away, which were all done electronically. The Demons was broadcasted as five episodes between the 22nd of May and the 19th of June 1971, and acted not only as the closing story of season 8, but the conclusion of the master story arc, with the character actually successfully getting captured by a unit at the end of the story, as opposed to his usual escaping that we were used to seeing. When producer Barry Letts submitted his brief to the BBC Head of Serials for Season 8, it was with the intention that it was to feature 26 episodes. This would have meant that The Demons was originally intended to be a six-part story, but reduced to five due to production difficulties. There was a myth that circulated that it was an intention to have an episode 6, which featured the Doctor and Unit in pursuit of the Master, but this was never the intention. As such, The Demons was the third and final Doctor Who story to be made up as five episodes, with the previous two having occurred in season six with The Dominators and The Mind Robber. Had it been a six-part story, then I feel it would have become overstretched with way too much padding, which would diminish the plotline. As a four-part story, I feel it would have had certain elements of the plot rushed out. Although with it being a five-part story, there are certain elements of the story that are drawn out, such as Unit's efforts to penetrate the heat barrier taking up a large portion of the story for him, as well as the build-up in part one, based mainly around the news crew covering the excavation, and then they virtually are forgotten about and disappear from the story by the end of part two, with the addition of the Doctor also being out of action for about half of part two as well. However, the second half of the story is far more suitably paced. The Demons is a favourite amongst many Doctor Who fans, and it's easy to see why. It typifies all about the John Pertwee era, from the inclusion of the unit and the master, and a typical picturesque English village as the setting for a stranded on Earth story. The story channels in with a cult film movement that was emerging in the UK at the time, and also laid down theories within Doctor Who that the concept of Satan or the devil has been influenced by a powerful alien entity, and as such, was further explored in stories such as Pyramids and Mars, The Impossible Planet, and The Satan Pit. Additionally, 
The story is perhaps verbally fondly thought of by carefully and tastefully excluding the inclusion of any content that could have caused controversy at the time without dampening the feel of the story. So, that concludes my review on the demons. Of course, it is only my opinion, so feel free to express your own in the comments below if you think differently. Be sure to tune in for my next video, but if you do have a suggestion for a story for me to review, then just let me know. But remember, it's the end, but the moment has been prepared for.